slide, unfortunately, but the slides method is great as well. Um, because students can add stuff to the slide, but you can also show them if they zoom out, and John Martin showed me this as well in a previous active teaching lab. If they zoom out their view, they can add like shapes outside in the gray space and add additional comments to each other. So that's nice. And then one other thing, if people are thinking about students, because I always try to think like, is there a way to take the activity we did and make it asynchronous for anybody that couldn't make it? I've, um, and I, just throwing ideas out there. You can take that slide deck that students worked on during the live session and then the extension activity could be, you know, go pick a random slide and then sort of like see what the students were working on and add your own sort of next level step. So there's ways to make that something useful beyond just the activity itself, which I really like. Yeah, using that, um, the space around the slide for directions, uh, for comments. Um, you can actually have the presenter notes be sort of the takeaway. So sh show us what you did, but then put a summary in the presenter notes of what you did. That's a that's a great way. And, and Google Slides is used by K-12 a lot. Um, so your students are already familiar with it, probably, unless they're non-traditional students, which is a thing, but even so, um, if an older returning student is in a group with a bunch of uh, younger students, it's pretty easy to pick up and they've got a, a support group right there that knows how to use them that can um, help them figure that out. So yeah. it's a it's a really great way to get things started. Go ahead, David. I was going to say one thing about uh, media and Google Slides is that you can create a canvas of any size or orientation. So if you're annotating, say, a eight and a half by 11 page. I like to create the slide document as a tabloid size because it's just more the shape of documents and then it gives that little breathing room for shapes or images or other asynchronous additions to that slide deck. I'm going to find a, a, a link to uh, bunch of uh, activities on using Google Slides um, and I'm going to it's an activity sheet that we did in the past here um, and I'm going to put it in chat if I can but um, I'm going to do that and, and I'm going to put it in uh, the resources on the bottom of the activity sheet so any other thoughts on that you know one thing that I um, that I have used and it works pretty well is um, I have problem sets that I give to each team, you know, as a Google Google Doc, and then I embed a Google folder onto the Canvas page. Um, so, you know, like the 10 team documents are sitting in that folder that everybody can see. And so it kind of provides a way for students to look at their own Google Doc and work with the team on that, as well as look at other um, team documents is, and in addition, you know, like the TA and I can look to see what they're doing, you know, kind of like the same idea that you that you brought with the uh, with the slides. Thank you. Okay. That's a good idea. Okay, so let's let's go ahead and start looking at this left column here, um, and. If things come up with um, in your brain as we're going through those, again, unmute and jump in and let us know what you're thinking. So our first one is how do you convince students that they'll learn better by participating? Um, the holy grail of questions in, for teachers, right? Uh, because we know that when they are convinced, um, they, they do better. Um, teaching is nicer for you, learning is nicer for the rest of the students because people are into it instead of pulling them when they're kicking and screaming and don't want to be involved. So how do we do that? Um, well, we've got this first thing here. Um, have the activity tie into something bigger. Um, in some ways, this goes back to make it about the learning objectives, right? And if the students see and remind them, Remind them all the time. Remind them in the assignment. 
this activity, I want you to do blah, blah, because it ties in with blah, blah, which is important for achieving the goals that you are here to achieve, uh, which will help you get a job and, you know, make lots of money or whatever your reason is here, uh, is for being here. They have to see that. Um, even better is say, as part of the assignment, I want you to reflect on how this can be useful in your career, not if it can be or if it can't be, but how it can be. And that way you're nudging them not to like say, well, it's not going to be useful. You got to give me an answer. Make something up. Make it, you know, pretend. If the students can't see that for themselves, and I will be honest, there were plenty of times in my life as an undergrad and a graduate student where I was doing something and I'm like, I don't understand why I'm doing this. This is stupid. This is a waste of time. And it comes off as this is busy work and I resent the instructor because I'm feeling like they're wasting my time. If I have a conversation with somebody else in my class and I hear from them why it's valuable to them, I might be like, oh, I never thought of it that way. So any times that you can get students to sort of crowdsource or, or share their answers of why this is important to them, it'll be like, oh, I hadn't thought of that way. Um, and the more, the, the more diverse reasons for it being useful that they hear, the better chance that they'll be like, okay, I get it. I understand why, um, because you've given me, you know, a hundred reasons and 99 of them are no good, but that hundredth one, that one hit. Um, so what, whatever you can do to make it stick and you can't come up with all of them for the students. So ask them to do it and share it with each other. Other ideas, thoughts? Peter, I see your hand is up. Is that up again or is that up oh, from last sorry. time? No, no worries. I, I left it left. I didn't lower it. Sorry. That's all right. I was uh, just going to add, John. Yeah. That um, one of the pieces that I recorded for the asynchronous resource that I contributed to the lab was a story about a video that I felt was the most engaging because I was looking at the analytics. And apart from that example, I found that if I titled things related to like um, advice about how to be successful with the midterm or tips about how to um, connect effectively with Zoom, that those had higher participation than just like randomly titled videos that were like lecture, you know, pre-lecture video one or whatever it is. So thinking about those little wins that you can achieve by being specific about sitting in the your student's shoes and seeing what will motivate them to just gather information on their own. Yeah, whatever clues you can put in. And, and, and again, this is like reminding them of why this is important and why it's tied back to your learning objectives. Now, this is also a really good trip, a tip or trick for us as instructors because it reminds to make sure that our activities are tightly connected to the, um, the learning objectives and outcomes for the course because, uh, you know, it happens to all of us. We're like, oh, there's this really cool thing that I'm interested in, but it might not be something that is tied to the course objectives. So although it's interesting to us, it's not necessary or interesting to our students, um, but we often throw that in. So this kind of says, helps us say, um, oh, wait, as I look at that title, as I look at that description, how does this tie back? It doesn't. Maybe I can set it off to the side and say, hey, if you're interested in a nice to, nice to know thing, take a look at this, but this is optional. Because um, students, again, they'll resent you if, you if they feel like you are wasting their time. Good. And I, I encourage you all to, to take a look at those, um, uh, that video that David put together for us. Um, it really goes into the details of these five tips. Um, and in many ways, this is not a, I think this is not a, when you first start stuff, maybe it is if you wanted to start it right. But a lot of this is stuff that it's like, oh, I should go back and look at what I've done so far and update and fix it. Um, and looking at your analytics is a really good, you know, it's something we don't often do. Very good. All right. Any other thoughts on that first one from anyone? Something you've done, something you've seen? 
something you've heard from students. This right, is slightly, down. like yes. not exactly answering the question, but uh, I have been doing like, you know, my students watch videos asynchronously, but then we are having like two live sessions a week, um, less than we normally would do in person, but still two. And this is related to Friday's winter retreat, if anybody is thinking about going to that in terms of um, student mental, uh, supporting student um, mental health. Um, I've definitely already received a lot of feedback from students that they're just excited to be with other students right now, especially if you're teaching remotely. Um, so finding ways to even just add a little bit of socialness to the activity. I try to frame all of the activities we're doing with first, you know, hey, maybe check in with how each other are doing, you know, like have something a little fun in there too. Because I think we all are needing those little personal connections right now. And that's another way to maybe sell it a little particularly in the current environment. Excellent. All right, let's take a look at um, media feels like an add on, especially subtitles on videos. Um, oh my gosh, the adding transcripts and captions and subtitles on videos was a huge pain in the butt for a long time. Um, the auto transcripts are getting so much better now. Um, they're not perfect yet. Um, so whatever is auto generated in the transcripts, you should go through and edit that to make sure that there aren't weird word interpretations that the machine link learning does. Um, that happens quite a bit, but it's so much easier than it was before. Um, I was just looking at some Kaltura video this morning with the transcripts on it, and as the video plays, the text of the transcript is below that, and it actually highlights as you, as you see it. This is fantastic um, multimodal learning for students so that they can stop, rewind, um, click, you know, they can scan up. They don't have to like rewind and listen to like, what was that point again? I just click on those words and I can do that. It helps them go through the video faster. So you probably won't be surprised that students rarely watch video at um, regular 100% speed. It's usually one and a half times speed, sometimes twice as fast. I can't, I lose track after like one, 1. 1.75, um, but it helps if I have something to scan and listen at the same time. Um, so in some ways, what felt like an add on before, I'm really starting to rely on it now. And I think that it's like videos are no longer just videos. It's video and that transcript. Even at home when I'm watching um, Netflix or whatever, I've got the closed captions on because I can't always track what's happening uh, with the language. So I don't know. Yeah, physics. <laughs> there is specialty language in 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 every discipline um, that you've got to go in afterwards. And um, some disciplines have more specialty language than others. And you're absolutely right. It's going to take a little bit of time for the machine learning to catch up to that. But it's hopefully getting better. Um, yeah. All right. Did I just hear, I heard a beep. Okay. Um, so how sensitive is, are the auto transcripts to pronunciation? Mm -hmm. Not great, uh, you know, not good, but not great. I think, again, things are getting better. Um, even if you compared the auto transcript generation of six months ago compared to what it is now, it's just steadily improving. Um, we'll, we'll see. So use them, but again, go in afterwards and clean them up if you can. Oh, Todd, that's right. I'm, I'm glad that you're here. 
and I'm anxiously looking forward to what you have to, to say uh, here, and I invite you to unmute yourself and join us if you're interested in doing so, but you know, no need to. Angela, you muted yeah, yourself. Yeah, I was muted. That was kind of an unintentional plug to have shorter videos, because if you are going to do auto-generate and go through your own transcripts, having a five-minute video is a lot quicker. I don't even necessarily listen to myself anymore. I can just kind of check through and say, that seems weird. Um, so it's a lot easier if you're making those shorter videos than if you're doing like a 30-minute, then that can take forever to go through. So it's like a, it reinforces the short videos for us, too. Yeah. Yeah, Todd, please do jump in. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'll try here. My computer's lagging a little bit, so hopefully I'm coming through clearly. Um, so two things. One, and this is kind of fresh off the press, and so I can't say when it's going to be available, but we've been pushing Kaltura to provide a way to differentiate machine-generated transcripts or um, caption tracks from professional or edited ones. And so I heard from Indiana today that they got word that that feature has finally been implemented. So we should be able to do something like YouTube where when machine captions are machine caption tracks are added, it should say something like English parentheses auto generated parentheses. Um, so that students know, OK, this is something that is a rough version versus, um, you know, like the professional versions that we provide for accommodations. Great. So, and then the other thing you haven't really gotten to this and I don't really see it on the list, but it's coming up more frequently is related to it. Um, people call it different things, audio descriptions, vid visual descriptions. Um, and where on the accommodation side where we run into the most trouble is where videos are created, where everything is visual and the audio track is all it provides is like music or something like that. So if somebody can't see that, they have no idea what's going on. Um, so we, um, the opposite of that is a full audio description, which is fairly time consuming, um, is expensive and um, isn't really supported by YouTube or Kaltura or anything like that. You really have to just publish a second copy of it. So the in-between that meets the needs for most students is, um, is audio tracks that include not verbatim what's on the slide, but gives uh, learners at least an idea of what's happening and what the information is on the slide. So either they can get that information auditorily or they have a reference point to know what they're missing. All so, right, so if it's not, if nobody, if it's happens and there isn't also a talk along describing what's happening, then the, uh, the transcripts won't capture that. So you need to sort of explain, you know, image of or video of uh, the process of what's happening, but not just the, the process of what's happening, but explaining, describing what is happening. Um, it's kind of that, video, you know, picture versus a thousand words. You need the thousand words there in some ways, mm -hmm. um, if it's important, if you don't have that picture, um, if the picture if they can't see the picture, you also need to describe the thousand words. Good. Right. Image descriptions. Good. I am going to try to capture that here, um, and I invite someone to make that a little bit more clear. Mm -hmm. um, so building, can. I'd say kind of building that into, building some mm -hmm. level of audio description into scripts, um, and not just putting things up on the screen and never talking about them. And the, I mean, the really concrete examples is the how-to videos, like some of the COVID-19 tests where it shows the six steps you need to do while playing music or, you know, something like that. And so if you're blind, you have no idea what those six steps are because they just flashed across the screen and there is no information in the audio track. Really good, really good point. Thank you. Um, just as a FYI for um, folks, our Kaltura admin in Duet um, has recently departed, and they are currently hiring a new Kaltura admin. So if things are happening or not happening as quickly as um, you need them to happen in Kaltura, um, updates aren't being done or, or whatever, 
Um, give them a little bit of slack there. They are severely shorthanded right now um, and working as fast as they can to sort of um, catch up and get new people to, to help out with that. So just a, an FYI um, on, about compassion, if you will. OK, good. Other thoughts on that? Oh, there was one other thing that I was going to discuss or pull off of that, Todd, and I forgot what that was. Any other thoughts that anyone else had based on what was, Todd was just sharing there? I think it's um, a mindset that I've adopted to um, to try and think of transcripts. And John, what you talk a lot about universal design for learning is like an essential component of what I'm trying to achieve. And that there are opportunities that I can take advantage of that, you know, I wouldn't be able to if I didn't have those functions. So for instance, with transcripts, with uh, captions, and the ability to search, as folks have been pointing out in the Google Doc, those you know afford students who have English as a second language certain kinds of affordances. It um, helps with environments that are loud, so that you know if you're sitting in you know a big open space, socially distanced, and trying to listen to a video to have that track that you can pull up and still take advantage of the time that you have in your day. Those are all things that kind of start to add up in terms of students finding that material useful. Yeah. Um, the thing that I was also going to talk about when, when Todd was talking was um, starting off with scripts can also really help um, sort of prevent the add on afterthought um, of transcripts. Um, and the other nice, beautiful thing about that is that they help you sort of plan out what it is that you're going to talk about. Um, and it keeps you on task so that you're not ran, uh, rambling, the, much the way that I am often rambling in these live sessions that are unscripted. Um, and I want to point you to this idea of that David shares in, in step number two of pre-visualize. A storyboard will help you with this as well. So visually, a visual script, if you will, um, but then also following that up with an actual script. Um, and I'll tell you that the first few times that you use a script, it's going to feel very stilted and awkward, um, probably, unless you're amazing at it from a natural, um, but it gets better, right? So after you do it a few times, it starts to feel more and more natural and eventually it's just the way that you operate um, and it becomes it comes off very clearly um, but also so much more clear because you're not rambling as much so that's i think helpful yeah so you you already use scripts feel free to unmute if you'd like and tell us about the scripts that you use man yeah there I mean, I've only I've only used a few videos on um, on my canvas. I, I work in the physics learning center, so we do supplemental instruction. Um, so when we went online, I recorded videos for some of our demonstrations that we would have done, you know, in person. Um, and for those, like for the demos, I found that I didn't really have to record a script because I've been doing this for 11 years. So I, you know, so like I have. I kind of have the script in my brain, so I kind of, you know, hit the button in my brain and it goes. So like for the demos, that wasn't really a problem. Um, when I recorded the script or when I recorded the video for the introduction to my Canvas page, that's when it was really helpful because I tried and it was like, I thought it was going to be like four minutes that sucker was like 12 minutes long before I actually stuck to the script. So yeah, definitely, definitely write, write a script. And even if you don't stick to it, um, it's, it still helps. I had uh, my students um, back when I was teaching freshmen as sort of an introductory activity, I had them create a video introducing themselves so they could like self edit, self present what it is that they wanted to share. Um, and I said, you know, a one to three minute video, you know, let's keep it sort of smallish. 
but man, it was hard to keep it down to under three minutes unless I had a script. Um, and then the script again also helped guide me so that I didn't say all kinds of other stuff. Um, so it, it really does help that way. Angela, go ahead. I see uh, your hand up. Yeah, I was going to add on to the script uh, conversation. I feel like if it's me, if I'm making a video where I'm talking to the camera, I definitely like to have that script. And um, I found I can like make the video really small and so I can see myself still and the script below it. That's been very helpful. Um, if you have glasses, I highly recommend dimming your computer if you can so there's less of a reflection. But I also have discovered that if it's a screen capture video, I am much more of the rambly sort, but I instead of remaking a script, I do my rambly thing that ends up being 15 or 20 minutes, and then there's a lot of chopping it down so it gets to that 10 minutes. So if scripts are uh, something you're not practicing yet, you can do the other method. It's just, I feel like in some ways it's, are, are you gonna prep more ahead of time or are you gonna prep, you know, to spend a little more time listening to yourself afterwards? Although I do, um, uh, your comment, John, about having students prepare a script. I do have them do a little video presentation at the end of the semester. And so part of the scaffolding is they turn in their um, slides so they can get some feedback. And I also tell them, you know, go ahead and write your script at the same time, at least draft it out, because from their perspective, they need to record. They're not going to edit it. They're just going to do their 12 minute recording. So anytime you're doing it live um, for students too, I think the scripting I got some feedback that they didn't want to do it initially, but once they did it, they realized how helpful that was for their presentations. And, and if you think about it, it's a great way to have them sort of um, in medical uh, training. There's this idea of teach back. So I explain to you, take three pills twice a day, da 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 da, -da and then I say, okay, can you explain? Go home. You might explain this to your your partner. What will you say to your partner? And, and they have to sort of take my words and then repeat it back to me. It's just conveying what I said in a different, in your own language. Making a script is like saying, describe the concept to a, a, a family member, right? you know, an elderly uh, person or, or, or younger person. Uh, make a tweet that describes the concept. Any other different form that you can take it outside of sort of the academic jargon and have them rephrase that, and a script is a great way of doing that. Um, it make it gets them to think about well, what's important, what's not important. Um, how do I how do I put this in a way that my audience will um, understand it? Um, so it gets them thinking about audience. It gives them practice speaking as you know on the topic in your discipline, perhaps. Um, there's a lot of different ways of 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 doing that, um, and a script is a great way to do that. Great. Um, you had mentioned glasses, and I, uh, there's there's all kinds of YouTube videos that shows you that explain how to decrease this sort of reflection you see in my glasses. Um, I'm right in front of a window, and I don't do that because I like looking out the window. Um, but if I were creating a professional instructional video, I would probably close the blinds on my window and light the sides. And there's all kinds of uh, again, uh, just Google that on YouTube. Um, do a search on YouTube for how do I get the reduced screen glare and you'll see lots of different videos on how to do that. You don't always need to have your face in the lecture videos. Um, do a narrated PowerPoint, it's easier. Um, you can back it up again with, with the text again um, if you have uh, descriptions of that text as well. Or even better, um, make it a Google slide so that the students can actually access the slides themselves and then Use the screen reader there. Um, let's see what else, but yeah, you don't necessarily have to have your picture um, there. If you do a screen in screen picture in Kaltura, the file size is actually twice as big because it's the picture in picture file is a full video size and then the um, screen itself is another one. So it's smaller videos means lower bandwidth. The lower bandwidth means more equity as far as your um, students who might be trying to access this in uh, communities in Wisconsin or across the world who don't have great um, internet bandwidth. So think about them too. OK, other thoughts on that before we move on to the next one? We've got 15 minutes left. I think we're uh, we're feeling all right. 
What do students want? Anybody know the really easy way to figure this out? You can ask, ask them. Ask, ask them. them, yes. So course survey, great. That's 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 wonderful. Even a simple discussion with a single person during office hours will give you some insight on that. I've heard people um, who have like course representatives. Uh, so there'll be a team of five students whose job it is to, rep to represent the class's feeling about things. Um, and then the students then can say uh, it's kind of a neat way to sort of get across, get over the uh, anonymity thing by saying, come to the table and tell me what are people thinking? And that way they don't have to say, well, personally, I think da 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 da. -da. They can say, I've heard da 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 da. -da. And you know, it's not them talking necessarily, they're just communicating there in the messenger. Um, and so that helps in some ways protect them um, from that power dynamic of a student giving feedback to instructors. Anonymous feedback in um, Google surveys is another one. Um, making it a reflection question, part of your any assignment that you do. How effective was whatever it is that we did? Um, media, video in this case. Um, what could I do better? How would it, how would you learn better if or, or what would I need to do for you to learn better? Um, this also introduces a, sort of a meta cognition for the students. So whenever they're thinking about this, they're thinking about what did I learn? How might I have learned that differently? And that's a really good thinking, you know, a deeper level thinking than just memorizing the content because now they're reflecting on what did I learn? How could I learn it better? That's way better. Um, so just make that part of your question or a little bit of reflection on that. All right, I've got, I see that some, we've got a, a re question raised by Nate. Go ahead, Nate. Yeah, this is um, it's not so much a question as I, I did conduct that survey and that was the one that I had put on there. And it was really interesting to see some of the feedback. In some cases, uh, students saying that they preferred bullet point, which was uh, surprising to me. And that time didn't always matter. It was more about the value and how it was delivered, going to the passion piece. They said, if you're monotone, five minutes is too long. Uh, but if you're you know, engaged and you're providing value, then you know, there's almost, there was no limit, which was really kind of surprising. Um, one thing that I've always been curious about is that survey, I was only able to do it for one class because I had my assumption of what the media preferences should be. And I thought, well, I'll ask the students. I mean, I'm wondering if there are different preferences for different kind of students drawn to different programs. This was a very technical class, so I don't I wonder if they have a preference and kind of even. You know, I, more wanting to read or a bullet point type of thing um, versus maybe one is more drawn to visuals. And so I, I thought it would be interesting if anybody's ever done research out there to see if different kind of student bodies in different programs are drawn. To media but um yeah we did that survey it was really it was very interesting and so i put a link to it in my uh, onedrive account and i'll leave it there for a while in that um chapter that i link at the very bottom of the activity sheet on uh, finding the sweet spot there's all the, it does a very good job I, I skimmed through it very quickly but um there's there's a, a lot of uh citations and research that is shared there about certainly about the passion um, and also about the connection. So instructor presence is something that in an asynchronous class, especially, you know, we're not there face to face in person to sort of have those connections, to have those nonverbal um, moments um, where we where we where we connect with our students and we feel feel that connection, if you will. The research apparently says, and I haven't read through this other than to see what other people say that it says, um, that videos do that. Videos can do that very, very well. It's so important. We know absolutely lots of research on this that students rely on instructor passion um, for motivation, for why is this important? Well, my instructor is super animated about this, so that's that's uh, 
communicable. What's the word I'm looking for? Contagious, right? Um, passion isn't contagious. So any way that we can have that, um, not just for the instructors, but bring in people from past classes to say, what I learned in this class has really helped me out from da 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 da. Here's where I struggled. Here's how I handled the struggle. Looking back, I would handle the struggle differently this way. Um, hearing this from you, you know, your own personal story is good for students, but there's a power dynamic. There's often a generational dynamic uh, difference between there, right? Hearing it from close peers, people that look and sound and feel and act and whatever like them um, is so much better. So if you can have um, people even from last semester come in and say, wow, I learned a lot in this class and this is exactly that's why we hire undergrad tutors. They're closer. They can explain things better that we as experts um, have lost or have already internalized. So the methods are gone. Um, you know the the struggle the issues that we challenges that we faced. Um, we don't face them anymore and we forget oftentimes that students face them, but close peers are very good at saying I know what you're thinking. You're struggling with this part. I was just there just their last semester. Um, so that's that's really important as far as uh, passion and um, the ability to communicate with each other. Good, any other thoughts on that? I was just going to uh, add. Yeah. John, just the. Um, the idea of. Like consumer expectations whether it's a traditional age student or otherwise, there's so much outside higher education that is edutainment or edu you know, just straight up entertainment that educators I think need to know where that intersection is. And sometimes that just translates to defining what your own quality means. Um, you know, maybe we don't need to be broadcast quality, but it's certainly good if students can see and hear you clearly and just to like work your way toward that sweet spot of production methods and the genre that you're working in because um, video is more than any one thing it's communication it's conveying core content it's interaction it's a project and so just kind of sorting out like where is student expectation and how much are you you know, departing from that to your own um, particular needs. And one of the really nice things about um, video these days is that the quality of TikTok videos and stuff, that's low, right? So the bar in some ways when we say video, you know, 10 years ago, video meant professional studio quality and it felt very intimidating. Um, at this point, we have lowered the bar enough that it's easy enough that informal looking videos are par for the por par for the course and very accessible. But what is really important is that you use a good microphone. Don't use the microphone that's built into your laptop because that's awful and the students and you know your audience will not tolerate bad audio the way that they'll tolerate bad video um, because there's something that's much more intimate about our ear input than in our visual input. Um, so that's yeah, don't let good perfect get in the way of good enough. Um, and l lucky for us, that's sort of the expectation these days is good enough. Good. All right, we've only got like five minutes left, so somehow that's um, changed us. All right, so students are being asked to learn multiple platforms. This is an important point. Um, every new tool that the students have to learn is a barrier to their learning. So what can we do to streamline that process? But there's a counterpoint here as well. There might be a tool that everybody uses that's super complicated. And if students come saying, wow, I'm really familiar with this tool. Don't make me use this other tool. Honor that, you know, if you can. If you can say, I don't care what tool you use to make your video, if you're going to make video, for example. Um, use your use iMovie, use Premiere, use um, the YouTube editing if you want to, whatever you're most familiar with. 
I just want the end result to fit inside this box, right? So I don't care how you get there, student. Um, just you bring it into this, and hopefully that box is Canvas, which is sort of the universal on campus anyway, um, output for presenting those things. And again, hopefully with transcripts and um, accessible accessibility. accessibility. So yes, yeah, standardization really uh, freaks me out because I'm afraid that they're going to standardize on something that's awful, um, as often as the case. I, and I I didn't say that, okay? But yes, Angela, you were going to say something. Unmute. Oh, just on the um, point, you were if if you are asking students to make a video, I do think I found it's helpful. So I I make them do it through BBC Ultra, which sounds crazy, but they essentially go into a room and record. That way, to me, it's streamlined. They don't have to upload anything. It's all there. Um, so I provide super detailed instructions. But if there was a group that were like, you know, we're really good with Premiere and we'd really like to do this other thing, uh, I think that's fine. So I think it's helpful to have a structure in place yes. that is something you're familiar with and you can provide instructions with so that if they need help with it, you know how to help, but then leave that outside possibility that if there is something they love and they want to use, they can just like let you know and you can work that out. Yeah, don't don't put up extra barriers for the students if they want to fly, you know, but yeah, it is very important to give them a, an easy baseline uh, that's doable and as accessible to as many as possible. So good. All right, we talked a little bit about Google Slides already. Uh, we talked about audio and video descriptions already. Um, our last point here, I think, is going to be what is the tool or way that it has been working well for you all? Hey, look, it's a question for everybody uh, to replicate writing on a whiteboard. Ooh, I have an idea and I'm going to point you to this right here. Do, 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 do. You can go to Amazon or whatever and get these suckers for 20 bucks and it's just a gooseneck to put your webcam on, clamp it to the side of your table and have it hang over your paper and paper and pen and write notes. Um, your students are already doing this with their phones, right? Where they're just doing this and you can set up. There are things to set these up as well. Um, lots of hacks on, on on how to do that. Or you, if you're fancy, you can get an actual document camera um, for a hundred and whatever bucks. Um, to to, pro to demonstrate processes, but there's there's pretty easy workarounds if you already have a webcam that's not just the webcam that's built into your laptop. Although there are workarounds to have to use like CD ROMs on top of your webcam for that as well as a mirror. I don't know. It's kind of cool. A lot of options there. Other ideas that people have. Uh, another analog solution is just to do whatever you can do um, with, with a slate or a small whiteboard. And then if you're making the transition to digital, like iPad is kind of best in class as far as I'm concerned, but you know the, the Microsoft Surface project products are uh, you know very natural handwriting focused. And there are some tu tutorials out there and how to guides about how to make the best transition into Zoom, which has its own whiteboard, for instance. So um, once you get into the weeds with that, it becomes a little fussy, but there are pathways that people have found successful. Yeah, hey, it's two o'clock. I invite you to leave if you need to leave. I'm happy to stick around for the next couple of minutes and continue this conversation. I see Nate has his hand up and I've got another thing to add on this as well. Thank you for joining us if you have to leave and we'll see you next week or tomorrow. We can continue this conversation same time. Uh, there's a link in uh, the invitation. However, you got here. You can join us again tomorrow. But uh, yes, Nate, tell us about Rocketbook. Oh, Rocketbook. I've heard about this. You have that? Well, I don't want to have somebody I work with does and that could be a, a uh, coupling your webcam with a Rocketbook could allow the best of both worlds where you could do something analog, but then also save it to the cloud. So basically, getting the notes taken, and that would also help with accessibility. Basic, anything that you wrote down would then become immediately accessible. They also make beacons that you can put on a whiteboard uh, that if you take a picture of it with a phone, it takes that and shoots that up in the cloud too. So any drawings and things. So I thought I'd just share that in case people want to Yeah. Start. One of the things that um, 
David mentioned iPads and Surface, and one of the things that I've always struggled with or hated about that is you don't see the hand. It's just, you know, the handwriting on the wall. You don't actually see the hand. And there's something, again, this is with gestures and nonverbal communication. If you can see me, you know, tapping my pen and circling this, you know, there's something about the, the hand and the gestures that's really important. It feels more embodied than just sort of seeing text show up on a on a surface. Um, but if you can't do that and you have an iPad, mm -hmm. then by all means use it. Yeah, well, we had um, a Hindi script tutorial series that we did, and that's a really good example of where you need to see the full human technology interaction unfold. Um, with this catalog of math videos that I've been working on, which is like over 60, almost 70 videos, the the digital form of of uh, doing the math with a little human embodiment so you see the person, the instructor, seem to be the better mix, um, especially with just the time that you put in, especially if you're recording. Um, if you make an error and your worksheet's all messed up, like you got to be able to just, you know, do an undo and then move on. Yeah. Yeah. And if you're really fancy and you're doing a lot of problem solving um, that needs to happen, go ahead and invest in one of those, you know, glass boards that lets you write and stand behind it and trans turns things backwards and upside down and or whatever. Mm -hmm. they, do. Yeah. they do some visual tricks there. Very cool. Um, Very cool. A little bit pricier than most people can jump into, although I know that there are DIY uh, workarounds and such. Mm -hmm, for sure. Right. Any other thoughts people have on this topic? Again, I'm going to invite you to join us tomorrow, um, and hopefully you all got the Active Teaching Lab email that has the invitation link for tomorrow's 1 to 2 p.m. Uh, session where we'll dig in closer. Bring your own specific learning environments and we can um, we can find the, a way to solve any problems that you have specific to that learning environment. It's a, usually a, a much more intimate discussion. All right, thanks everybody. Thanks y'all.